efficient way. Oh, I see, it's just been recorded. Sorry for those who join us later, you just missed the first couple of slides. Um, so the um, temperatures are quite important. And so um, the first 100, 150 degrees, we're just, as, as it suggests, dewatering. So the water comes out um, and that will be visible or non-visible depending on atmospheric conditions and, and the, the, the eventual flue gas temperature. Um, and then as it phases through from dry wood through charcoal and then to ash, the, the air, um, sorry, the, 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 this isn't the air temperature, this is the, the temperature of the combustion phase, but we're adding in primary air to achieve those type of temperatures. And um, then you're moving into a secondary combustion phase. So as the gases are burnt off at much higher temperatures and so you've got carbon monoxide hydrogen and carbon in its gaseous form and then you've got carbon monoxide um, as a secondary product so there's very distinct phases and it's important that any boiler is able to walk through those in a nicely controlled way and you'll see as we go through there's a number of different design approaches that, that are all relatively consistent that pellet boilers take in order to step through that quite distinct phases and, and stages of combustion so there's a, a, a good rule the 3t rule um, you know it's just the, <laughs> everyone knows the 3t rule but high temperature for good combustion enough residence time so that's very important to get full secondary combustion and turbulence so ensuring that you have enough oxygen mixed so you get good um, fuel to oxygen ratios and also you are um, optimizing heat transfer so if we just have a look uh, in a generic pellet boiler setup um, this is particularly the Aquafen one, but it applies to the vast majority, if, if not all of them in, in one way or another. Um, so fuel comes in the bottom, and we'll look at that a bit more. And you've got the, the primary stage here. In an Aquafen system, that's an underfed grate, and so there's no turbulence of fuel. You don't have fuel dropping onto the top, which can, uh, or, or being pushed from the side, which um, occurs in some, especially the dropping from the top is, is potentially a bit more problematic in disturbing your uh, ember bed um, and you've got gasification occurring and very very stable levels of oxygen um, meaning you get low particulate emissions and also low carbon monoxide production which is important and then you move up here into our secondary combustion zone so you've got air being fed all the way around this is a, a big ring essentially and so you've got air being blasted up, so, so it comes through here. And um, you do want lots of turbulence here, so, so you want calm conditions there. So just as anyone, if you've, if, you've, if you've had a fire at a camp, which everyone I'm sure has had, if you fiddle with the fire a lot, like your kids are getting involved and they love just tattooing and having given it a poke, it doesn't actually burn very well. You want a nice stable bed of embers. But then up here, we want to introduce as much oxygen as we possibly can in, in the most fluid way we can so that we get really good secondary combustion and we're getting up to much higher temperatures up here. And then the flue gases are forced back down. So you get quite a bit of heat transfer into the water jacket at this point and also um, continued you know, high temperature performance and heavier ones will tend to, to drop further down. And, and get reintroduced back into cycle, heavier meaning that there's more combustion product left. And so it's got a, another opportunity to get going and to take out any, any extra energy. Um, and then up here, we've got, again, uh, a lot of turbulence occurring because of the, um, the springs and, and you've actually got turbulators in here in the aquifer model and, and there's many similar designs. And so you get good uh, heat exchange to the sides of the, the boiler, the water jacket, and, and a good dwell time, you know, from, from this moment up and down and back up again, 
it's at least a second and you'll see why that's important but but just for now we've got our three t's and and we're, we're making sure that that all of those occur within the combustion zone um but we also as well as getting high temperature up here we, we get quite high temperatures down at the bottom in the primary area but we've got to be careful especially in new zealand um because we've got very high silica content in a lot of our pellets um, they still meet the international standards, but they tend to have quite high content because we've got volcanic soils. Um, and so we don't want high temperatures, very high temperatures above 1200, 1300 degrees here because you get slag formation. And that will occur if there's not enough air being pushed through and, and the products of combustion are not being moved through the system, let's say, if, they, if they're getting locked in. So... Uh, carbon monoxide is something we want to try and avoid and um, so the air to uh, fuel ratio is really important and you can see you know about one and a quarter um, air ratio is, is, is the, the, the sweet spot where you start really losing it and but if you have too little air you, you get an enormous increase very very rapid increase in carbon monoxide production. Um, so if we just look at it from an aquifer context, we're going to look at lots of different boilers today, but obviously I know quite a bit about the aquifer ones and they're a good pricey for, for all types of pellet boilers. Um, in an aquifer context, we, we've got a um, what's called ECC, so that the combustion control and it's being constantly monitored. So it's real time continuous commissioning, you could say. Uh, the temperature is being monitored in, in the secondary zone. So we're, we're looking at what's the highest temperature and, and trying to keep it nicely in, the, in the, the optimum window. There's a negative pressure monitoring as well. So how much air is moving through the system, which then um, becomes a, a simile for how much oxygen is available for combustion. So getting that fuel to oxygen ratio just in the sweet spot and the fuel that's available because it's being constantly fed in through a, a, an auger system into the bottom fed grate. So here's the day hopper, fuel goes through up there. And um, so that the balance in terms of temperature, fuel, air is giving you um, the well, air out and air in. Um, again, in the aquifer system, it's completely controlled so that the combustion chamber is a gas sealed unit. So the only air that's able to enter is through the fan system and that's entirely controlled. So by knowing the speed and, and therefore so controlling the speed of the fan, introducing air and monitoring the negative pressure that's existing in the system through draft, the boiler has a very good idea of how much air is available. There's a fixed amount of oxygen available in the air depending on altitude and it's also controlling the fuel. So you get a very precise um, management of combustion. So as I said, it's continuous and automatic calibration of the air and fuel. And so variation in fuel quality is managed very easily because if you're monitoring temperature and you know how much fuel is going in and how much air, you can get an idea, okay, well, hmm, this is odd. We're putting in, you know, maybe twice as much fuel, but the, um, the temperature is remaining very static or, or, or more, to, we could say, the temperature is dropping. So therefore, you need to introduce more fuel. So it's a continuous way of monitoring by the boiler to make sure that it's hitting the optimum conditions. Probably less of a, an issue in this country, I would hope, with the fuel quality that we have here, but still um, something to, to bear in mind. Um, and it means that the boilers don't require combustion commissioning at install or even after servicing. So it's, if anyone's been involved with gas boilers, it's a significant cost to um, tune a gas boiler and un, uh, every service and, and an untuned boiler won't be working that efficiently. Um, you also get stepless modulation because of the real time um, staging of all these processes and very low carbon monoxide and particulate emissions. Uh, we'll look at those in a sec. So. How you control combustion has a massive impact on the emissions. And so the two main approaches, uh, most systems have a lambda sensor and that's maybe one that people are most familiar with. And then the, the Okafen approach and, and quite possibly some other boilers, although I'm not familiar with them, um, have the continuous combustion um, process. And what's really interesting to me is that if you look at the, the scale, when you've got a lambda, you're, you're, you're analyzing the gases like down the track essentially because you're you're looking at what's happening after combustion you're not 
you're 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 always slightly behind because you're looking at what has has occurred rather than what is occurring currently um because you're 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 sensing the food gas um and so it, it can be quite peaky that the, the darker line here at the bottom is carbon monoxide and if you just look at the scale you know we're peaking up to 2000 or more parts per million and and the base is you is you know somewhere around 400 to I don't know, maybe 100, 200 or so. If, if we drew a, a, a line through here, I, I would imagine it'd be around the, the 200 mark. If we over, go and have a look over here at how Kofan boiler controls carbon monoxide, we're peaking at sub 60. You know, the scales here are very different. And we're sitting at around 20 to 30 parts per million. So it's maybe 100 times less, uh, sorry, 10 times less carbon monoxide production. Um, and the, the, the ultimate target is high efficiency and low emissions. And efficiency is measured by the calorific balance about how much energy is in the fuel minus the losses against the energy gain into the water. So we're gonna lose performance, we're gonna lose energy through the exhaust gases, through partially burnt gas and fuel and radiative losses. So in a Okafen context, the partial burning is, is very low, less than 1%, and, and you, you'd hope that this would be for all pellet boilers, uh, especially the commercially off-the-shelf ones. The radiative losses are low as well because you've got good levels of insulation. If anyone's seen a pellet boiler, you'll know that they've got the circuitry, the controls, the display, all on board, and those kind of things really don't like getting too hot. So they definitely need to be very well insulated because if they weren't then that lot would just get fried and you'd suddenly have a boiler that wasn't functioning anymore because it's just burnt its own controls out um exhaust gases can have a significant impact on efficiency but there's got to be a balance because if the flue gas is too low condensation forms and can damage the flue outlet so usually about 120 to 160 degrees 180 degrees so we just have a quick look through different brands available in New Zealand. I'm not gonna look in detail at every single one because um, there's a lot of like um, details. We'll just pull out some specific bits as we go through, but um, it also gives you an overview of what is available. Interestingly, every single one of the boilers that we'll look at today, except for one, um, is from Austria um, and the other one's from Switzerland, which is <laughs> neighboring to Austria. And so they very much captured the, the market in these higher performance, um, you know, small to medium sized pellet commercial boilers. Um, so these are uh, Froling um, and relatively similar to Orcafen in, in some ways, they have quite a different um, pellet feed mechanism and they have a closed grate, which um, potentially has some, some uh, issues around it and maintenance wise. Um, and then uh, Etta, Another Austrian manufacturer, they've uh, opted for a side fed grate and then a, 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 a heat exchanging on the side. Um, tends to be a, a, a bit of a bigger boiler. Um, and Hertz, which is again bigger again. Um, and so, some of these boilers, um, I've, I've just shown you dedicated pellet ones, but there are ones that can do chip or pellet or even logs or, or pellet or, or both um in a commercial context in new zealand i think it's unlikely to, at this scale to, to to warrant having both in my opinion because your fuel delivery infrastructure becomes many times more complicated and uh, and therefore expensive um so i'm really just focusing on the, the dedicated pellet ones you see the hertz boiler it's, it's got the same you know system in in some ways of uh, primary combustion and then secondary combustion and, and turbulence and the recycling of the of the um, flue gases um, and again it's a closed chamber here which um, can present some maintenance uh, issues um, kwb it's a rolling grate so you've basically just got a great big conveyor belt that pellets drop onto and then as they progress through the combustion cycle and, and those stages that we talked about, they should be getting to ash by the time they get to the end and then they fall off and there's a, an ash bin here. Um, so this, this big grate is essentially inside. Um, again, maintenance, whether or not 
there's some you know, maintenance involved in, in moving grates like this and, and, and stuff in stuck or um, would be a question. Uh, Schmid, the, the, uh, the, uh, the Swiss outlier in this list of Austrian uh, boilers, um, all of them have got pellet feed systems, but Schmid and, and I think KWB both tended to use a, a lot more auger fed rather than vacuum fed systems. Um, and then, you know, similar, you've got the, the, the burn chamber and then recirculation and, and um, heat exchanging going on. Um, and the Aquafen boiler, which you've seen already um, a little bit of, and there's a variety of different aspects here that are quite specific and unique to them. Um, so the first stage in getting the pellets there, we looked at how pellets are stored last time. And the easiest way by far to move them is, is by a vacuum system. And, and the majority of companies now supply their boilers with a vacuum system as standard. A, a vacuum is, is a slight misnomer because you've actually got a fan up here in, in the aquifer context and, and the same with pretty much all of them. And so one tube is blowing air and then as it blows across, um, so you see air gets blown here and as it blows across the end of the, the pellet feed uh, or pellet store system, um, it, it blows pellets out essentially of, of this little container where the pellets drop into and then they're blown here and they fall into the boiler and they fall into the day hopper so into here so yeah it's called vacuum but actually it's a blower um, and then the day hopper is what um, might be filled multiple times in a commercial context because certainly for the aquifer that's about 65 kilos in, in some of the other ones it might be 100 and 120 kilos but they're not huge volumes and that then has a feed mechanism through into the boiler. Um, and you'll see that, you know, the same thing here. We, 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 in this case, they're augering it and they've got this, this agitator that moves around to make sure the pellets fall down. And then um, it gets augered in and drops. And, you know, there's a variety of drives and motors and things. Um, and then once it's in the boiler, um, Let's just look. So there's a couple of different ways of doing burn back protection because the last thing that we ever want is for fire to get into our day hopper. Of course, that's disastrous. And every pellet boiler is going to have a very effective means of preventing that from happening, um, preferably multi-stage and, and you know, with, with layers of redundancy and also automated so that if there is a power cut, um, well, you know, the default position is closed and it has to actively be open. Um, so you get immediate blockage if, if there is a power cut and, and um, controlled combustion ceases. So this is the Froling one and they have a couple of gate valves which stop the pellets that, so they get drop out of the, the, the fuel hopper and augered up a little way and then they fall down through this this door shoot in onto the top of the, the fire um, and you've got a couple of gate valves which um, would be normally closed or have to actively be open so a belimo valve type thing and then this is the ETA system with a rotary valve so again that the pellets are up here in a in a bulk store and they drop down these little chutes and the auger brings them to a rotary valve and actually they end up lying in these trays and and then being drawn around and dropped into the second auger, which moves them into the burn chamber. So should power cease, then these cease to turn and you've got a physical barrier between the burn chamber and the box door, same here, physical barrier. Um, and then with the walker fin, it's a, a ball valve with a Belimo um, motor. So it's normally closed and um, the spring loaded for opening so that when the boiler wants fuel it says okay I want you to open this and the, the motor draws it back and, and the ball valve opens pellets then drop down into the auger system and and it closes and that they can't drop down it's um in the Ockfen context the um the ball valve is uh, got a double gasket and so it's also a gas seal so the only way that air can get into the combustion chamber is through the fan system. So it's controlled. Um, and we've also got 
ways of putting them on the fire grate so they can be get pushed on the side or they can drop in the top um we're just going to have dealt with that um and in an orcafen context they come up from below so you know in the same way an old coal boiler essentially is is fed with a an, an underfed grate and so you've got pellets moving through the auger and, and they get pushed up um and here you can see the ignition cartridge so with the orcafen cartridge that uh, example that's a, a little electric uh, igniter with air forced air so you've got a jet of very hot air coming out the end and it's only using 250 watts of power and because it's got air blown over it all the time you don't have overheating issues and then the, the, the primary and secondary air comes up in the tubes so this whole assembly at the back is essentially an air box um so does this animation work yeah look at that I hope you can see that the pellets looking like little maggots crawling through or being forced to auger through the the um the pipe and then they push up and so you get movement of the pellets um in this case in the ocafen one from the middle outwards but it would equally apply with other boilers um to, for the primary heating and dewatering phase and then you can see there's quite a marked difference in the color of the of the pellets as they move out into the gas release and um carbonization phase or decarbonization, I guess you could say. Um, and then um, the, the combustion is, is occurring and then ash and this falls off the side and, and drops off. So um, in the aquifer context, the, the, the grate itself doesn't move, the pellets move off the grate. And there's a bit of a shimmy. It's not shown here, but the, this round grate actually gets a bit of a shimmy on um, just by being pushed backwards and forwards to, to ensure that, that, that it works. Um, other ways uh, is you've got a tipping grate, and so um, the whole lot is just opened up and, and slides off, or a, a, a moving step grate, and we saw that with the Hertz boiler as well. Uh, sorry, no, the KWB one, which is on a, a bigger scale. And so these are different approaches to the same um, question. You just need to be aware of what maintenance requirements are around the different types of great because if things are going to go wrong they tend to go wrong in this area with clinker getting stuck um and just, you know stopping the grate from closing again so you know making sure that combustion is being monitored really well and the fuel quality um is being addressed and so you know, just getting an understanding from the supplier of what are the maintenance needs and and how robust is the system and, and what are your clients' expectations around that? Um, so just a bit of detail on the orca fence system. You saw that there's the, the, the central feed coming up and pellets move here and get pushed outwards and fall off the edge. You've also got this reciprocation, uh, re reciprocating segments essentially. And so when the, the whole assembly is pushed backwards and forwards a, a few centimeters, and they kind of wiggle a bit is the best way to describe it. They kind of, you know, they're toothed. So they, whenever this device is moved a little bit, the, the teeth um, push and pull each other out and back a little bit. And so they're essentially giving a little shimmy to encourage ash to, to work its way from middle to, to, to outer edge and then fall off. Um, and something interesting that we found in New Zealand with the, the pellets that we have here, it's really important that we have short but frequent cleaning of the grate. And, and when I say frequent, I mean we have it set for three minutes every 20 minutes. So every 20 minutes for three minutes that the grate gives a little shimmy and helps you know, push, let's say, bits of clinker and ash off. Otherwise, with the pellets we, we have, especially ones manufactured in North Island, quite high silica content, they meet the international requirements, but they do tend to, to fuse a bit. Um, and so we, we want to keep them moving, keep them going so that they break up and, and don't form any crust, because a crust is going to disturb your, your primary combustion area and it's going to disturb the primary oxygen, in this case, coming up through these holes, um, primary air. And, and cause potential issues. Um, so if we look at how uh, the, the, the heat exchangers are cleaned, you've got springs, you saw it on quite a lot of the other ones. 
So um, it's a big reciprocating system and it, and it moves up and down and then goes clang and drops them all and, and all the stuff, fly ash that might have built up on them or to the sides gets cleaned off. Um, and then ash is mechanically transferred to an external box and, and for ETA boiler, very similar. Um, and, and all of them have got forms of this of, of one kind or another. You've got cleaning, you've got the, the you can see there's turbulators inside the, the certainly the bottom here um, and in the aquifer context they go all the way up and essentially so you're getting turbulence and you're getting cleaning so that ash is, is 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 any fly ash that settles is dropped back out and then you've got an augering system to remove the ash from the um, base of it from the you know, variety of different designs into an external box where the ash is then easily removed. And how easily removed is it? This is a caretaker at Netherton School, um, just showing the Envira School's team how he does it. So he picks up, uh, activates a little wee box on the side, picks it up, looking very stylish, thank you, John, and then dumps it straight on the Madakai. So one thing to note is that ash from pellets is a certified organic fertilizer. There's no issues around disposal at all. If you've got any sort of grounds or people who work there who've got gardens, they'd be happy to take it because it's pretty much pure potash. So great for the tomatoes and other fruits and vegetables. And you get about five kilos per tonne of fuel and with good efficient combustion, maybe up to 10. But yeah, we're talking about a tiny amount. So five to 10 kilos of ash for every five megawatts of heat energy, megawatt hours. Um, it's not a great deal to deal with. And one of the complaints we've actually had from John was that the boiler's boring and that he doesn't have enough to do with it because he's used to stoking an old coal boiler and you know every day he's in there all right so if we just have a look at the internals um we've got a water jacket and it's really important again we're dealing with a biomass fuel here there is moisture in the pellets and so we must maintain that water jacket during combustion above 55 degrees because otherwise you're going to get condensation forming on the metal wall. So, so essentially, just like in a, in a wet back fire, you could say in a, in a domestic context, just to give you an example, if you have the wet back in the firebox and you have cold water in the, 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 the guts of the wet back, that wall that is meeting between the fire and the cold fluid is going to get condensation forming on it. And um, that will then lead to rusting or and or creosote forming. And so essentially you, you destroy your boiler or you insulate your boiler from the inside out. So that's the no-no in pellet boilers. And so there's a, a variety of different ways of approaching it. Um, the Ocafen boiler has an injector mixer. And so returning water is injected back in, in and uh, it's an automatic uh, varying mix that when it first starts and, and you have much more cold than hot, you've got a small amount being injected in. And then as the returning water increase in temperature, more is, is, is um, released until it's, it's just complete flow uh, above 55 degrees returning water. And so what I'm saying is that it's this wall here where you get the problems because you've got flue gases exposed directly as it's just a wall of metal. And so if that is too cold, you will get back end um, problems and, and you'll get rust and, and, and creosote forming, which is obviously disastrous. Um, and so other systems, this is an ETA example, they have a mixer and an additional pump so that um, to start with a, a lot of returning water is uh, sorry a lot of supply water so, so the hot water coming from the boiler here in this context is mixed back in and so you're essentially just closing the loop so you're closing this 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 loop here um, you're closing that so the boiler's heating its own water until it gets to a nice temperature and then it it slowly reintroduces the the returning water you also have pump control so that the pump uh, the circulating pump, not that one, that's the mixing pump, but the circulating pump doesn't release it before 60 degrees. So there's some different strategies used by different manufacturers to protect against uncontrolled temperature rise, because it's another obviously critical issue is that we're dealing with a solid fuel here. And so there can be um, continuation of combustion after we want it to stop, either because the heat demands 
ceased and, and so we don't need the heat anymore or you know at worst there's been say a power cut or something like that um and so how long will that fuel carry on burning how much thermal capacity is there available to absorb that thermal energy and what mechanisms are available to block combustion and ultimately what's going to happen if, if all the shit goes wrong and, and we really need to bail and, and and cool this stuff down fast so one of the primary ones uh, that's used by a lot of manufacturers are buffer tanks um, because they absorb the thermal energy as the remaining pellets are burned out. So you might have a buffer tank set point of 70 degrees, but it's going to peak up to 75 or 80 um, as it absorbs that final uh, set of energy from the boiler as it, as it does a controlled burnout. Um, and are actually required on many designs of pellet boiler, so for ETA, for example, and, and Hertz um, and many others, will require a buffer tank because they have a pretty big burn chamber and there's quite a lot of residual fuel because of the moving grate scenario. If you've got a, a bed of embers on there and pellets, you've got to burn them out um, for it to work efficiently and therefore you need to, to make sure that heat energy is absorbed. And also as the models get larger, it can become more and more important because there's more thermal inertia. Um, but if a boiler can completely stop combustion air going through, um, and the only example I know of that is, is Okafen, that the froling may be um, similar, um, then you don't need a buffer tank because you can just say, okay, I'm not allowing any more air in without air, you cannot have any more combustion. And therefore you've just got the inertia of the thermal capacity in the boiler water to deal with. Um, so that's the second point. Um, so if we're ensuring that it shuts down early enough, then the, the boiler water, um, which might be a hundred and so in Okafen, 135 liters in ETA, I think it's more like 200 liters has uh, the ability to absorb that that heat energy in there and um, but you've got to have a really good understanding of control logic and the boiler operating cycle and that's why i went through at the beginning so you know having really good advice from the boiler supplier and that they really understand fully how these boilers work so that they're not peaking out at too high a temperature and and essentially overshooting their inertia point um but all of them have pressure and over temperature relief valves so if the temperature continues to increase they're going to open a relief valve and um, dump their water uh, before it turns to steam but ideally we, we don't want to be doing that um, and if you, know, if you lose system pressure then you're not going to be able to start back up again without um, re-pressurizing the system and if it's an auto top up and it just dumps and then automatically top ups, you're losing any of your um, anti-corrosion anti protection. And it's also indicating that there's some serious issues around control and capacity and, and um, hydraulic design because it, it really shouldn't be doing that. Um, another uh, ultimate backup system is, is for water to be sprayed into the combustion chamber or, or into um, if, if maybe some boilers, they've got a detection system in the ashtray um this is only available on some boilers um for example that the Okafen doesn't include it um and it's the ultimate backup but really wants to be avoided because you've got a big cleanup job if you've just put a whole load of water into pellets and, and they swell up and, and um, cause you know all sorts of problems um and potentially you can have damage as well through thermal shock um to the boiler so best avoided whenever possible so we just have a look at the sizing. I'm using uh, Okafen example because I've got the most access to the information, but I had a good look at all the other available boilers in New Zealand and they all span a pretty similar range. Um, some of the other boilers go up to a larger capacity in a single boiler. So I think the biggest that I saw was 260 kilowatts. But apart from that, it's a very similar range. Um, and once you get above that, that size, um the uh it stops being a, a practical or single pellet boiler um unless you're making a bespoke industrial one just because all those details that we've just been through about the combustion phases and about good control and good safety it becomes very difficult to do as the boiler gets you know above 250 260 kilowatts um in the 
Oka, for an example, and, and quite a few others that I saw, you cascade the boilers. Um, someone's asked about turn down ratio. I'm going to come to that in a sec. Um, so the um, again, this is an example that you can apply to, to other um, boiler systems, but with the Okafen context, the 64s would normally be cascaded in up to four, giving you 256 kilowatts of capacity. And, and these would be treated as one system, but just as we do with a gas boiler, you, you've got a cascade of four. So you've got a great deal of redundancy and you've got a huge modulation range as well. And the same with the twin boilers, um, each one's 128 kilowatts for the pair. And you notice actually, it's a slight cheat. These are actually two 64 kilowatt boilers that are side by side, but they've got a singular control and um, either one or two pellet feeds. Um, so they can operate in independently, um, but they, when they're twinned in a cascade like this, they, they operate as one boiler for, for modulation purposes. And so then we can go up to half a megawatt and then you can have cascades of cascades and that there's really nothing stopping you from keeping on going except for um, price uh, and, um, you know, efficiency is still amazing. But but once you start getting up to one, one and a half meg, you're probably going to be into dedicated boilers rather than just having squirrely ends of small ones. Um, but I think that there's a really interesting aspect to this modulation uh, and cascading in retrofit of existing buildings, which we've got an awful lot of, especially gas boilers, especially up in, you know, inaccessible rooftop or upper story plant rooms where you've only got a service elevator or, you know, I've been to some hilariously difficult ones where our friends, the architects decided to put the plant room up a ladder on the sixth story and it's like, well, okay, this is really quite challenging to get half a meg of, of um, uh, uh, service up here. Um, luckily, there was a hatch in the floor and, and a, you know, an overhead gantry, but you still got a little access point and, and you know, uh, moving half megawatt or megawatt boilers around is, is very big material. Whereas if you're moving 10 64 kilowatt boilers, for example, as, as these essentially break down into, they can be split in half, it becomes entirely feasible. Sure, it's more expensive potentially than buying one very big one, but then if you don't have a huge amount of civil work and chopping up the building to do, then actually net cost will be very competitive if, if not actually probably significantly cheaper. Um, so just to give you an example, this is a 256 kilowatt cascade at a college. And so we've got two 128s, but they're, they're all functioning as an individual boiler. So they've each got their own pellet feed. They've each got their own pump at the back. Um, and there's one control system. So essentially you've got one master and three slaves, but it's entirely balanced duty cycling. And each individual boiler acts in its own right. And so when they first come on, you see all four at 100%, and then they'll drop off until you're left with one at 30%. Um, so the, in this example, you've got 3.3 meters in that direction by two and a half meters in that. So, you know, sure, they're not as compact as gas boilers, but they're not ridiculous either. Um, and just giving an idea that they'd also fit in a 20 foot shipping container. So we look at modulation. Generally, um, we're, we're looking at 30 percent would be the minimum output and again I, I did some research and, and I know that for the Aquafen but across the board it seemed to be that um, with these boilers up to 260 kilowatts there's a modulation range of 30 to 100 percent how, how step that is and how smooth it is will vary quite a lot by boiler manufacturer um, but certainly you know for, a, for an Aquafen 64 kilowatts you'll go from 19 up to 64 and 260 of um, I think this was a uh kwb possibly um 80 kilowatts up to 260 and then for cascades the great thing is it is a cascade of single boilers so um again i'll, I'll just use the aquafen context four 128 kilowatt boilers so this or essentially uh, another pair to another you know two boilers just like this will give you half a meg of output 
but the minimum is only 38 kilowatts. So it's a huge modulation rate, you know, nice two and a half percent modulation, which is amazing if we're looking at a building where you've got very varying heat loading. I'm thinking especially here retrofits where and, and the temperate New Zealand climate where we don't need to be overheating. We should be way more efficient with the heating. We can put really good BMS controls in, which gets where the compensation going and um, doing a, a, a very efficient use of the heating system and therefore get maximum full system benefit, not just combustion efficiency, but the full system. Um, and there's no real upper limit with the cascades. And so therefore, um, you, you can have this enormous modulation range. So a couple more bits to look at before we move on. Uh, flue gas condensing. Um, this is available on a few of them. Uh, Ocofen were the pioneer of this technology where essentially it works in a very similar way to a, a gas condensing system where you're condensing latent heat energy from the water vapour in the flue gases out. Um, and we do need cool water coming back to the boiler to make it work just as you would for any gas condensing system. And um, because otherwise, if, if, if the water, you know, it, for it to work, the water needs to come back in here cool enough that it, the, the, the water vapour in the flue gas does condense out and therefore releases its latent heat. Nothing more complicated than that. But we've got quite a smart little heat exchanger here and then uh, a flushing mechanism because you will get particulates forming in here and, and, and essentially sticking to the walls because it's condensing, therefore moisture is going to uh, form on the walls, therefore it's going to be sticky, therefore stuff sticks. And so the, the, um, it needs to be flushed and, and that happens automatically. And then essentially the, a lot of the particulate matter ends up going down the drain, um, which is great because you can halve or more the particulate emissions from the pellet boiler. So if we're in a situation where um, resource consent would be easier to achieve with lower particulate emissions, then sticking a condensing unit on and working through you know how you're going to make sure that the return temperature is cool enough um, is a very smart way of, of adding it on and, and you get a 15 percent improvement in or up to 15 percent improvement in efficiency ergo you use 15 percent less fuel for the same delivered energy or, or you get 15 percent more fuel yeah energy for the same fuel whichever way you want to look at it but you, you're, you're you're extracting the last of the of the energy available in that fuel um just a quick thing about how the boilers run i think we've got enough time for this um the from the ocfen perspective you've got a soft start and so fires detected at 120 degrees and then um it stabilizes uh, and, and so pauses essentially in in um in operation in order to to to, to, to flatten the curve a bit and then once it's a nice stable position, it shifts into its power mode. Um, and so you've got a very nice, smooth curve here. The, the, I think one of the reasons the Austrians are very good at this stuff is that they're quite patient and they're quite calm. And they're just like, look, you know, just take your time over this stuff and allow it to move through. And, and therefore you protect the, the component tree and you, you, you have a good um uh, longevity of the whole system and, and a good controlled combustion what you really don't want to be doing is, is what we do with gas and just go okay turn on the burners full noise <laughs> so there is some delay um you know it might only be a matter of short minutes um at the very most going from completely cold to starting would be 15 minutes um and so therefore you know some in, in, inclusion in the hydraulic design uh consideration of that which we'll look at next week um and then once it's in power mode certainly from the aquafen context the pumps released once the the boiler jacket the water temperature is at, at 60 degrees and then at 64 degrees which is you know obviously a very small difference modulation starting because again we don't want to overshoot we don't want to get to a position where it's like oh damn it no turn it off turn it off slow down we want to have a nice calm progression so that it hits the sweet spot which is about 70 degrees that these can be modified a bit but as you start getting higher and higher, you, you, you have less 
window for opportunity for for closing uh, it down in a controlled and calm way. Um, so we want to hit around the 70 degrees and ensure there's inertia in the system. And so just getting that balance right. And, and we've done a lot of work here on retrofit systems where we want to hold a nice consistent temperature, but because the New Zealand is such a temperate climate, the boiler's often thinking, oh, you don't need so much heat. It's like, well, naturally we really do because the, bo the building's really badly insulated. And, and um, yeah, so the heat curves become quite interesting to, to deal with. We'll look at that next week. Um, but the modulation wise, you get, um, if the boiler is capable of, of having very rapid and, and dynamic modulation, you get a really nice, smooth, flat uh, um, curve. We're flattening the curve, just like we do for COVID. <laughs> um, if it's not capable of such smooth modulation, then that's where buffering again comes in to, to help smooth and flatten that off um, without the boiler controls. That's me. Done. Marcus, fantastic. Let's just um, give everybody a chance to absorb all that and think about some questions. <laughs> The yeah, one, the one I wrote down yeah. was, uh, uh, as we went through, is do they do condensing versions of it? And, of course, you answered it before I asked it, so that was cool. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I did actually have a question. Are there any issues with cascading, for example, a 64 kilowatt with a series of 128s? Do they just all no. build together? Yeah, they do, because um, what you'd end up with, um, you, well, you have to do it as – each 128 would have to be treated as its own 64 within it. So you could have five boilers and essentially, so, so let's say two, one, oh, hang on, I'll just go back to the slide just to make it a bit clearer. Um, so each of these 128s has got a 64 that it's made of. Um, and so if you had two 128s and a 64, you'd have to treat them as five 64s. Yeah. But yeah basically you just have two cascades you'd have one of three and one of two right gotcha thanks eddie okay um but yeah you can essentially have a cascade of a cascade um in that context so from an ocafen context our cascade is always four um uh so four 64s or four one of 28s but then you can have another four you know sat here or or, or another one sat here but it's still a four plus one rather than five gotcha okay hopefully i didn't totally overwhelm people it's quite a lot <laughs> it, so so just just on that i think um if i can just double double check that everybody here today that was at the first session got access to the video um, so I'm just thinking that, uh, yes, if there is a lot of information here, everybody might like to view this again via the video. Um, if anybody didn't get access to the video, I will just put up my email. Um, and if you can email me and I'll make sure, oh, got to type with the right keyboard. Um, I'll make sure you actually get access to this video and the previous videos if there's been any problem, you should be getting it directly from an email from your Eventbrite login. Um, but if I can also share um, um, the uh, um, slides if, if anyone wants as well. Yeah, that will, that would be great too. So there, that's that should be there. So if anybody um, has had difficulty getting hold of that, we can resend you the link. And David's would, yes, would love the slides. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, no oh, okay. So just, um, just rounding up, um, reminding you all that uh, next Wednesday, uh, Marcus is going to be back for session number three, We're focusing in on the practical implementation of the boilers. So it's the building design flue design refueling um, looking at containerized energy boxes which i'm sure you're going to explain what that means um the buffering controls and the estimation toolkit so there's some real system detail coming out um in the third session which is happening same time um next week cool
thanks a lot for all your feedback. Um, I'm glad it was helpful. That that's a, a pleasure. That's great. And yeah, I think we'll we'll call that a day and look forward to catching up with everybody again next Wednesday. Thanks, Roger. Okay. Thanks, Marcus. <laughs> <laughs>